Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. As we open up your word, we ask, Lord, that your spirit will teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I uh, will be taking our text from 2 Kings chapter 6, and I'll be reading from verse 1. And the sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us, we, go, we pray thee, go unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And they answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, to go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. And so he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in theater. And the iron do it swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Amen. I'm going to be sharing with you, recovering the axe head. Recovering the axe head. In the passage that we just read, the Bible says that the sons of the prophet, they came to their master and said unto him, The place where we dwell in is too narrow. This place is too straight. There is too much of constraint in this place. We need an expansion. There is a need for growth. Amen. They were able to recognize that they needed growth. A new vision dawned upon them. It dawned upon them that the place they were dwelling in was too narrow. It was too straight. It was too limiting. And so they could not accomplish the vision that God had given to them. And so they came to their master. There are inconveniences that God brings across our ways so that we may be able to take a step to move on. God does not desire that we stay in a place longer than necessary. In fact, at a point in time in the journey of Israel in the wilderness, God said to Moses, you have dwelt in this mountain for too long. There is a need for you to move on. Amen. Man has a tendency to want to remain in one place. And that happened at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, whereas God commanded Adam, you know, at creation, that he should go into the world and expand and multiply. The Bible says that the men of Tower of Babel, they were contented with staying in one place and they said, go to let us build us a place, in, let us build us a tower that will reach up unto heaven. And the Bible said, no, God said, no, this is not what I've commanded you to do on the earth. I have not commanded you to remain in the same place. And the scripture says that God scattered them it caused confusion, divided different languages unto them so that they will not understand one another and that they may not be able to accomplish the enterprise that they had set for themselves and so they were scattered into all the world and that's why we have what we have today so god desires that we should move on god does not desire that we should stay in a place longer than necessary and so these sons of the prophets they were not satisfied with where they were they were not contented with their situation they felt the place was too narrow and for them god used inconvenience you know for them to come to know that there are certain circumstances that we go through in life those circumstances are designed for us to desire something that is higher to desire another level, to desire another step. And so these sons of the prophet, they saw the need for growth. They saw the need for expansion. Amen. And they came to their master, Elisha. By coming to their, to their master, Elisha, that means that they recognized the authority of, 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 of their master. They recognized that Elisha was their master. They recognized that at least they should let him know their plans, they should let you know what they're about to do. Any vision that you have in your mind, any plan that you conceive, you must take it to God himself. You must take him because he is our ultimate master. The Holy Spirit is the master in the church. We must take our visions to him. We must take our plans to him. Whatever thought, whatever thought, whatever idea we are conceiving, we must take it to him. Amen. And so they came to Elisha and they said, Master, this is our plan. You know, we want to grow. We need an expansion. And it is amazing that Elisha said, go ahead. He was not against it. He was not intimidated by the desire of these sons of the prophet to grow. You must not be intimidated by the desire of others to grow. No, especially in the church. It must not happen. It must not be head of. Amen. The vineyard is so large that you alone cannot cultivate that vineyard. And so we need many more laborers. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he, he commanded us that we should pray to the Lord of Harvest that he will send for laborers. You cannot, no one single church, no 10 ministries, no matter how large they are, that will be able to undertake all the work that is required to be done in the vineyard. So don't get intimidated by others who want to grow. Encourage them, allow them to grow, allow them to move on. That is the way God has created man. God has created man from, 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 from babies 
stage to infancy, from infancy, you know, until it becomes an adult. That is process of growth. God wants everyone to grow. God wants us to move forward. God wants us to expand. He does not want us to stay in the same place in life. Amen. Praise God. Having conceived of this idea, having conceived of, of, of this plan, listen to what the sons of the prophet said. They went to their master Elisha again and they said, we want you to come along with us. We want you to come along with us. We recognize your authority. We recognize the grace upon your life. We recognize the anointing that you're carrying. So we want you to come along with us. Amen. Where you have an idea, where you have an idea, don't begin to implement that idea. Don't begin to carry it out until the presence of the Lord is with you or goes with you. That is very important. Amen. Ideas could be conceived by us. We take it back to God, but we must also seek Seek the presence of God. Moses said to God in Exodus chapter 33, verse 15, he said, Lord, if you will not carry us along, please, if you will not go with us, please do not carry us from this place. In other words, we are not ready to leave this place. We are not ready to take an inch out of where we are without your presence. Because without your presence, there is nothing that we can do. We are going to be defeated. We are going to be swallowed up by the enemy. We become an easy prey to the enemy. So, Lord, if your presence is not going to go with us, please do not take us out of this place. Amen. Now, in Matthew chapter 14, also beginning from verse 22, the Bible speaks of Jesus Christ. He had to constrain the disciples to go to the other side. He had to constrain because the disciples were not willing to go to the other side because they knew that Jesus was not going to accompany them. And they could not think of going on that kind of a journey on sea without the Lord Jesus Christ coming along with them. But after much persuasion, you know, they left without Christ. And as they were in the middle of the sea, Christ is now came. There was a great storm. The Bible says because the wind was contrary and there was water they were worried. I can imagine they would have said this is one of the reasons why we wanted Jesus you know, to come with us. So they were, they were unwilling to go without Jesus. As Christians we must be unwilling. We must be unwilling to implement any plan to implement any decision no matter how grand us, no matter how good it looks, no matter how beautiful, how excellent it might appear to us. We must be unwilling. We must not be ready to implement any plan without the presence of the Lord going with us. And so they demanded that Elijah should come along with them and Elisha agreed to go with them. Pray Praise God. Now, as they were felling the wood that would be used in building, the Bible says that the accent of one of the sons of the prophet fell into the river. And of course, as an iron, by falling into the river, it must have, it must have sunk right to the ground. And there's no way that these sons of the prophet would be able to get into the river to bring it out. Even if they get into the river, how would they be able to look for, uh, how would they be able to certify exactly where the accent is in those days that they didn't have the kind of modern, modern gadgets that we have? And so this thing fell. And what is the accent? The accent is basically an instrument of service. It's something that you work with. It's today, today we can liken it to the talents and gifts, you know, that God has bestowed us with in the church. So as he worked, as he labored, as he felt this beam in the process of expansion, trying to get wood that they will use to construct a new building, a bigger building that they will stay in, the Bible says the accent fell. And when it fell, what did he do? Hallelujah. Now, this was one of the main reasons why the sons of the prophet agreed to take Elisha with them. It was as if they knew, as if they perceived on the inside of them that there was going to be crisis and that they would need their master, Elisha. And so when this accent fell, the Bible says that this son of the prophet who was wielding the accent, from whose hand the accent fell, cried unto Elijah. He cried. There was a strong cry. He said, Alas, master. He went to him and he cried to him. Amen? When we have crisis, we must learn to go to God. We must learn to cry to him until he hears, until he answers. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. You continue to ask and you will receive. He didn't say ask and then you will receive. No, you continue to ask. It's a continuous exercise. The Bible says that the heaven of the, Lord, the, heaven of the heavens is the Lord, but the earth has it given to the sons of men. Except we invite God into our situations, he's not going to step in. He doesn't get crushed like the devil. No, he has given the earth to us. He's given authority to us. So we must cry. We must cry to him until he answers us, until he hears us. And so this son of the prophet cried unto Elisha, until Elisha answered him. Amen. It is important to note what that son of the prophet said when he cried to Elisha. He said, Alas, master, for it is borrowed. It is not mine. It is not mine. After this service, I must return it to him. And what am I going to tell the owner if I'm unable to get it out of the river? Amen. I must let you know that 
you are living on borrowed time. Your 24 hours that you have on a day does not belong to you, it belongs to God. And as a believer, I must also let you know that your life is not even yours. You are living on borrowed time. You are living on borrowed time. We should have died many years ago. But thank God in the fullness of time, Jesus came into this world and he died for our sins. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 say, We are not our own. We are not our own. Anything that you have does not belong to you. You are only a custodian. You are only a manager. You are only a steward. And as a steward, you are going to give an account of it at the last day. And that is the major reason why this son of the prophet cried unto Elijah. That accent does not belong to me. I am going to give an account of it at the end of the day. Therefore, it is important that I get it out of the water so that when we leave this place, when we are through with this assignment, I will return it. Amen? You are going to give an account of your life to God. You're going to give an account of your time to God. You're going to give an account of the resources made available to you to God. And therefore, you must manage them. You, it must always occur to you at every particular point in time that the resources that you have, including you as an individual, you do not belong to yourself. You are living on borrowed time. You are living on borrowed resources. Everything that you own, God has given them to you and you are going to give an account of them at the end of your earthly pilgrimage. Praise God. And so this son of the prophet cried unto Elijah, it is borrowed. And the prophet Elijah did not hesitate to intervene. This way, his sons, he had, he had a working relationship with them. And that was why, anyway, he came into the scene and he said, where fell it? Before there can be recovery in your life, you must identify where you have fallen. You must. It's not sufficient for you to cry. You must identify where you have missed it. Where have you gone the wrong way? You must be able to locate. There must be repentance. And for you to repent, you must know where you have gone wrong. You must know where you have sinned against God. The, the access is where did this access fall? That makes it easy to recover. You must know where you have fallen. You must know where you have turned your back to God. You must know where you have missed it. You must know where you have gone the wrong track. And thank God. The son of the prophet was able to identify. He said, come see where it has fallen. And he took Elisha there. And see what Elisha did. The Bible says he cut a tree and he cast it into the river. And as soon as the tree got into the river, the Bible said the axe did swim again. There is nothing in this universe that you throw into the water that will cause an iron to float. But because of the supernatural power of God, the anointing of God that was upon Elisha, as soon as that tree got into the water, the Bible said the axe did float again. Now that tree represents the cross of Calvary. When the cross of Calvary comes into any situation in life that, that is already sunk deep into the water, the cross of Calvary will cause it to float again. If your spiritual life has become drained, that there is nothing to speak about, it again when the cross of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ comes upon you, He will cause you to float again. No matter how deep in the merry clay you have been drenched in the pool of life, no matter the level of sin that you have committed, the cross of Jesus Christ is able to bring you up again and to cause you to float again. No matter how, no matter how downgraded your business is, no matter how downgraded your family, your home is, no matter what it is, no matter the extent to which the devil, you know, has made you to swim in the difficulties in life. The cross of Calvary will cause you to float again. And so this accent did float again. Amen. And Elisha said unto him, he said, man, now put up your hand and take it again. Yes, it's not sufficient for you to be recovered. You are not recovered so that you'll be yokeless. Jesus does not come to deliver you, to set you free from the yoke of the devil so that you'll be yokeless. No, he said, take my yoke and put upon you and you will find peace for yourself. The purpose of God of sending Jesus into this world is not so that we'll be yokeless, it's so that we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be yoked together with him. You must not be yokeless, you must be yoked together with him. So he said, pick up the accent. In other words, you are going back for service again. It is not sufficient that the Lord has set you free, you must return back to service again. You must go back to work because at the end of the day, at the end of your earthly pilgrimage, you are coming to give an account unto me. What is it that has fallen in your life? What is it that has sunk into the pool, into the river of life? The cross of Jesus Christ is able to bring it up again. It's able to cause you to float again. But all you need to do is to cry and to identify the place and repent as, as God to come in. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. We bless you for your word. Be glorified, O God. Whatever it is that has fallen into the river, let there be recovery, O God. In Jesus' name we pray.